Good morning, New City Church. Thanks for being here. If you're joining online, we appreciate you joining with us. If you guys want to stand with us and sing, I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy all oh, my day, oh yes I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. Sing God who's never late is working all things out, You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. I will for all my days. Yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Stand against, I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, oh yes, I will lift you high. The lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on my day. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I us this morning why we sing, why we celebrate. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. We take on the righteousness of God by putting our faith in in Jesus whose sacrifice was sufficient. So as we continue to sing these songs, let's celebrate the gospel and that we who are in Christ are free.
You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Happy Sunday to you. Uh, if you're with us online or here for the first time, uh, know that we're glad you're with us today. Uh, last week, we started a, a two-week mini-series titled Hot Topics in a Divided World. <laughs> last week, we talked about justice, what it means, and how we should think about it as Christians, ultimately seeing that justice is at the center of the gospel, that through the gospel, God makes every wrong right, showing that Jesus is perfect in justice, giving us uh, the opportunity to declare and display the gospel through our ministries of justice. And this week, we've got another hot topic, uh, politics. <laughs> and before we step into the danger zone of politics, I want to give you a heads up for our next series. Uh, next week, we're going to begin a 10-week journey in the book of Philippians that calls for a young church to advance the gospel in joy among trials and oppositions. Paul's goal was to encourage a relatively new church. And coming out of a strange year like we've had, I believe it will be very timely for our church. Uh, but that's uh, next week. Today I'm addressing what many would say uh, is best to be avoided. You know, growing up in the South, uh, the topics that were strongly discouraged to discuss, uh, and especially at the dinner table, uh, were religion, sex, money, and politics. Uh, well, here at New City, we like to talk about all of them. Uh, why? <laughs> because God's Word addresses all of them. Uh, and specifically today, we talk about politics. Uh, I don't think I have to do much convincing this week of why politics is a hot topic, especially here in the United States, uh, where we have a two-party system that forces people to choose a category, pitting two sides against one another, uh, making people ask or decide, are you Democrat or Republican? Are you conservative or liberal? Are you voting for Trump or are you voting for Biden? Are you red or blue? Are you donkey or an elephant? And we can't forget our often neglected third parties uh, that, that unfortunately rarely make it to a debate stage. And over the next six weeks, there are four scheduled debates where people by definition argue with each other. They bring forth arguments over multiple different topics and issues and things get heated. They get hot. And so innately, we all need to make a choice. Who are we going to vote for? Trump, Biden, third party, right in a vote not vote, uh, or maybe some are still holding out for Kanye. And it doesn't take long 
Uh, especially in today's political climate, when someone expresses who they'll vote for or, or who they're not voting for, for strong judgments to be made. And then to add to that, when others try to convince or campaign for a specific party or president, it doesn't take long for feathers to get ruffled. And so we're left thinking, how should we as followers of Christ think about this? Uh, because, we can't, uh, because what we can't do with politics is be apathetic. Because God's word calls us to use our minds as an act of worship, to think well about all things. Well, thankfully, uh, God's, God has given us his word to help guide us through our politically divided world. But that being said, uh, what makes this a little bit more challenging is that God's word does not overtly tell us who to vote for. Uh, and because of that, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Uh, but we still need to think well about this. Uh, and not just think rightly, but also speak and act rightly. You know, one of the greatest dangers in the American church that happens almost every election cycle is that brothers and sisters in Christ get mean, arrogant, uh, and just plain rude with each other and revert to blasting social media bullets or make mean, off-handed comments to one another. And as Christians, we have to wrestle with, uh, with what we have to wrestle with is that truth matters. What we say matters. We're called to defend what is true, fight for what is right, while at the same time, we have to wrestle and deal with how we say it. Because God's word is very clear about our use of words. You know, most marriages and close relationships learn very quickly that how we say what we say matters just as much uh, of, of how we say it. And I'll be the first to admit this, uh, that this is something I've had to grow in a ton, and I still have a long way to go. Uh, but as soon as we talk about, you know, it's, it's, so as we talk about politics, we have to have a multifaceted approach. So we're going to ask a few simple questions today to guide our time. One, how do we make decisions? Two, how should we think about politics? Number three, how should we talk about politics? And number four, where is our hope in politics? Our first question uh, will be a shorter section, but I think it's necessary to address because at the end of, the, end of our day, uh, voting is a decision. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent to try to influence our decision, trying to influence our vote. And so this is something we need to address. And then secondly, where we'll spend most of our time is how should we think about politics? Things like how should we think about government in general? Or how should we think about policies? And then also, how are we to think about leaders and leadership? Because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we're, making, uh, we're marking a ballot for a name, for a person. And then thirdly, as I've already mentioned, how should we talk about politics? And then lastly, where is our hope in politics? All the while driving towards our one main idea, seeing ultimately, you know, as I show our car, my cards for today, that Jesus is the only perfect king. And just like last week, uh, today's sermon will be very different than a normal New City Church sermon where we typically would stay in one passage of Scripture and go through it line by line, but almost in, and be in that passage of Scripture almost the entire time. Uh, but today, um, I'm going to have a lot of sub-points. We're going to be kind of all over the Bible. And so for you note-takers, be ready. The bulk of our time is going to feel uh, much like a lecture, just like last week, but I hope it will be helpful. And so that being said... Uh, let's get into our first point to lay some basic groundwork just for decision making. And I understand that decision making, uh, this is a really big topic that needs way more time uh, than I'm going to give it today. But as a very basic framework, uh, number one, how do we make decisions? For various reasons, uh, making decisions for many people uh, can be really hard. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but just trying to figure out uh, what to, what, which restaurant to eat at can oftentimes be very challenging. Or, or what about the decisions we have to make every day on what to wear that day? Sometimes this is way overthought, and then sometimes for some, maybe a little bit more thought could have been put into it. And then what about major life decisions? Uh, like who to marry or what college to go to or what to major in or where to work or what to do or where to live. Uh, and then things like today, who, sh who do we vote for? Uh, some, may be already, some may already be convinced in their mind on who to vote for and some uh, may be confused or apathetic. But at the end of the day, we need to think through how we should make decisions. Uh, and so really quickly, the first and most important framework for Christians to work inside of is God's Word. 
What does God's word say about our decision? This is by far the most important framework that we've got. As followers of Christ, we need to search out the scriptures. We need to let God's word guide our decision. We can't let emotion or our opinions drive us. We have to understand we all have our own biases and come from different walks of life. And that being said, we must let God's word drive our decision making. If God's word says we should care about an issue, uh, we should care about an issue. If God's word said we should act, uh, speak, and lead in a certain way, then we should do that. Uh, If God's word makes a command, then we should seek to obey it. And then secondly, what does wise counsel say? The book of Proverbs is covered with verses that speak on the wisdom of seeking wise counsel. Uh, If there is a non-moral decision to be made or the decision that is not overtly commanded by God, uh, then, what, uh, then what do others that know us, that know you, and are also seeking to obey God and obey his word, what do they say? Uh, we have to be careful not to let culture or those that uh, don't have the same worldview influence our decisions. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, uh, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And then lastly, under the guidance of God's word and in the community of wise counsel, where is the Holy Spirit directing you? Uh, There will be certain decisions that need to be made that are not completely black and white in God's word because of various complexities uh, where wise counsel may differ. Uh, And at this point, and really at every point in the decision-making process, uh, we need to go to God in prayer, praying for wisdom and direction. Uh, Praying that uh, with the Spirit's help, guided by His Word and guided by wise counsel, that we would make good decisions while also remembering that we are fallen and finite humans that live in a broken world. Uh, We all have biases. We're not uh, omnipotent, omniscient, nor omnipresent. For those that don't know what that means, that just means we don't know everything. We don't see everything. And so ultimately, after we search God's Word, after we've sought wise counsel and gone to the Lord in prayer for wisdom, uh, we have to trust that God is sovereign. We have to trust that God is all-powerful, seeing that we can't be crushed by our decisions on whether we get it right or wrong. And so as we think about politics, specifically knowing that come November 3rd, we have to make a decision on who to vote for, uh, we can use this same framework, which leads us to our next point. How should we think about politics? Which ultimately leads us to first act, ask, what does God's word say about politics? And to put it frankly, as I've already said, there is no command in Scripture that says uh, God would vote for a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, or any other third party. God's Word doesn't say we should vote for Trump, Biden, Jordanson, or Kanye. And so we need to ask, what does God's Word say about everything surrounding politics? Well, uh, it says a little bit about our relationship to human government. Uh, It says a lot about policies and issues and uh, as well as what to look for in a leader. And so that will be our framework for our second point. Uh, what does God say about government? What does God say about specific policies uh, and issues? And what does God say about leadership? First, uh, what does God say about government? There's three principles <laughs> that I want to point out about government in general. Uh, that the government is under God's authority, it's for our good, and it's limited. There it is. Just as a heads up, this slide is going to be quick, and so we're going to bring it back up. But uh, let's look at our first uh, principle, that government is under God's authority. Psalm twenty two twenty eight says, For kingship belongs to the Lord and rules over the nations. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6, speaking prophetically about Jesus' rule and reign, it says, The government shall be upon his shoulders. Uh, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created through Christ and for Christ. And so this, as a Christian, is one of the more freeing things when it comes to voting. We all cast a vote, uh, but God is sovereign over the entire process. Job 12, 23 says, He makes nations great and He destroys them. He expands nations and He abandons them. The government is not on our shoulders. The government is on God's shoulders. While also knowing and remembering we are absolutely part of the process. God holds us responsible for what we do. And we see that idea further emphasized in Romans 13. 
But we also see in Romans 13 uh, that government is for our good. Look what it says, starting in verse 1. In Romans 13, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Again, showing that God is over government and showing us we're to be subject to governing authorities. While also remembering that we first obey God before we, uh, before we obey man, as we see in Acts chapter 5. If a government tells us to not speak of Jesus or to not obey any of God's commands, we must obey God and not government. And so government is for our good, but only if we are also obeying God. Picking back up in Romans 13 and verse 2, this is what it says. It says, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. And so here, we see that the government is for our good. The rules and regulations our government puts in place are for our good. As long as we are not disobeying God's commands, we are to obey the rules and guidelines put in place by our government. Uh, But what I also want to point out is that government is also for our protection. Verse 3, it says, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And so a good and right government will help provide justice, as we talked about last week, helping to bring what is not good and right uh, and helping to make it right. More specifically, we see this in criminal justice. God's word tells us to respect and obey the government. Uh, We see Romans 13, 7. It says, Paul, uh, it says, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We see again in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, uh, it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And then we see the purpose of government in verse 14. It says, uh, To punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. And so we see that the role of government is to help praise what is good and punish what is bad. And as we've seen, uh, to maintain peace and order. And government is for our good, but we also must realize that government is limited. And we must realize that human governments are run by people that create broken systems, broken laws, and broken rules. Any human government on this side of heaven will be limited and broken. Because there are no governments on this side of heaven that can completely fix human depravity. Can't fix sin. Only God can redeem, fully redeem what is broken. There's no government that has that ability nor that power. The only perfect government will be after Christ returns where Jesus has his full rule and reign, where sin and brokenness are no more. And so that said, if we know that government, if we know that God is sovereign over government, if we know that government is for our good, uh, and we also know that government is limited, uh, then how should we think about the intricacies of our United States government? Well, we have to understand uh, that the God of the Bible does not perfectly line up with any government party uh, because we live for a different kingdom. We live under a different authority. The God of the Bible does not line up perfectly with the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Libertarian Party, nor any other third party. The only perfect kingdom or, or, or government is God's kingdom as portrayed in God's word. As Christians, there will be things on all sides that many would say, That's a typical Democratic view, or that's a typical Republican view, or any other third-party view. But when we see these things, we must affirm what God says is right and also reject what God says is wrong. Uh, And what is vitally important for us as Christians is that our political allegiance cannot be greater than our kingdom allegiance. Our American citizenship is only temporary, but our kingdom citizenship is forever. We should be more eager to herald our kingdom allegiance than the Pledge of Allegiance. And so we must understand the danger in identifying and fully adopting any political party. Because what innately happens is that we are automatically lumped into non-biblical ideas no matter which way you lean. This is not to say... We can't, be, uh, we can't say we're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, or any other third party. Uh, but as Dr. Tony Evans has said, has said we need to be Republican light. Or we need to be Democrat light or any other party light. Because no party perfectly matches up with God's kingdom. 
Our first allegiance is to God. Our first allegiance is to his word and his kingdom, not a political party nor a candidate. But what it also needs to be made clear is that we still need to be a part of the process. Voting is a small way to help bring visible and physical reconciliation to a broken world, while understanding it cannot bring ultimate spiritual reconciliation that is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that said... Uh, Let's take a quick dive and ask, uh, what does God say about specific policies and issues? Uh, The first one I want to start with is one of the more essential doctrines of the Christian faith uh, that has numerous different outworkings in the political realm. It's a word or a phrase that may uh, sound funny to you. Maybe you've never heard it, and that's okay. Uh, But as a category as Christians that we should care about and, and vote for is the Imago Dei. That just means it's upholding God's image, uh, upholding how God has ordered humanity. Uh, This uh, this has many different outworkings uh, in what what this looks like and what it sounds like in politics. Uh, We talked about this last week. We must affirm, regardless of who we vote for, that every life was equally made in God's image. Uh, This includes the unborn life. This includes those of different races and different ethnicities, different genders and different socioeconomic classes, as well as immigrants and refugees. Every single person on this planet was made in God's image and should be treated as such. We as Christians are to uphold God's view of life from the womb to the tomb. Every life under the sun is valuable, and when we see instances where lives are devalued and experience any form of oppression through death, neglect, or through inequality, as Christians, we should fight and vote, uh, knowing their life depends on it or could be greatly affected by it. Uh, We should be adamantly against abortion. We should be adamantly adamantly against overt racism, adamantly pro-women, adamantly pro-life in all areas of life. As God's people, we know these are not and should not be at odds with each other. But when we get into stereotypical American politics, they're often pitted against one another, uh, which is to further emphasize and further uh, is further proof of the brokenness and the danger of politics. Uh, And then to continue with this idea of the Mago Dei, we must also uh, what we must also reject is an unbiblical view of marriage. A biblical view of marriage is between one man and one woman. It's a picture that points to Christ and his church. It's a reflection of God. And anything that distorts that view goes against God's image. And as followers of Christ, we have a moral and we have a God-given responsibility to uphold God's design for marriage. And while knowing, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, uh, that when we uphold these things, we're to do them graciously and in love. Not out of hate, not out of ill will, but uh, we'll get into more of that later. And then next, as we saw last week, we're to care about uh, biblical justice, issues of biblical justice. We have a moral obligation from God's word as Christians to care for the oppressed, the poor, the orphan, the widow. We are to care for those who are judged unjustly, to reprove the ruthless, we're to bring justice to the fathers, we're to care for the homeless as well as refugees and immigrants. And so knowing that part of the biblical role of government is to praise what is good and reject what is bad. Uh, and in God's perfect kingdom, using Jesus as our example of the, perfect king, of the perfect king, who brought perfect justice, bringing what is good and right, a government that does these things is for the good of the people. It's a reflection, uh, although imperfect, of God's kingdom on earth. As followers of Christ, we have a God-given responsibility to do these things whether the government does them or not. And if the government does it, then praise God. And then uh, the next thing we should care about as Christians uh, is how government deals with money, specifically financial stewardship. We're called to be generous, to not be greedy, as well as to be good stewards of our resources. Uh, Spending money that we do not have is the principle in God's word that is adamantly opposed. Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borrows uh, but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. And to be clear on this, what we do not see prescribed in God's word is how much the government should tax. That's up for debate. Christians can disagree on this. However, what is not up for debate, and sorry to disappoint everyone here, is that we have to pay our taxes uh, and then, uh, next, again, as followers of Christ, as, as we saw in Romans 13, a good government provides protection and promotes peace. 
Uh, there's so much we could say here. But a military and the police are a gift from the government for the purpose of protecting its people, while also realizing that the goal is peace and not power. So the size and extent and involvement of the military and police is up for debate. Uh, But as a general principle, a military and the police are for the good of the people to help keep order and peace. And then lastly, another thing as God's people we should care about is the environment. It's God's creation. God created the world, and he entrusted his people to be good stewards of his creation. To be apathetic about environmental issues, it's not in the cards for Christians. However, that said, we must also remember, as we see in Genesis and in the book of Romans, that God's creation was made for the good of God's people. We're to use it for our good purposes while also not abusing it. God's people don't serve creation, we serve God, and in turn, we must steward well what he has given us. Uh, And so that being said, uh, this is obviously not a complete list, and it barely scratches the surface for many of these issues, but it's a starting point. It's a framework for for generic policies. And so that said, uh, what we should also care about in politics are not only the policies, but also the person. God's word speaks clearly about what we are to look for in leaders. Uh, The only example, just to be clear, the only example we have of a perfect leader is Jesus. However, in God's kingdom and in God's or in God's kindness, God's word gives us a model for leadership in the church, uh, which is a good standard. It's a good uh, model for every leader to aspire to, and what we should look for in leaders. While knowing we're looking for government leaders, not a pastor. Uh, But this should be the standard and aspirations for any leader. So what does God say about leadership? Uh, There are two primary things that we should look for in leaders, and it's character and competency. In a leader, we should look for both. However, when we search the Bible, what is talked about more between the two is character. So good, healthy biblical leadership should show hard work, should be diligent, should show humility and gentleness, be sober-minded, should be of sound mind, peaceful, hospitable, love what is good, should be self-controlled, teachable, spiritually mature, respectable, not greedy, not quick-tempered, not a gossip or rude. Leaders should be patient. Leaders are to bring peace and not discord. Their private life should be as upright as their public life, and the list could go on and on. With that said, competency absolutely matters. It's not to be ignored. <laughs> but, with that, uh, but what we can't ignore in the Bible is that God typically uses many, uh, what many would deem incompetent or weak people and makes them leaders and uses them for his good purposes. But with that said, <laughs> I want to be very clear. I'm not saying we should go around choosing incompetent leaders. Because every time God does this, he does it specifically to display God's power. In their weakness. And what is absolutely necessary for that leader is to be yielded by God, to be yielded by God's power, uh, to God's power, and not relying on his or, her, or his or her or own strength. And so, just as a general leadership principle, as seen in the Bible, we should look for the most competent and godly leaders we can find. Uh, while knowing that God's word puts more emphasis on character than competency. And on top of that, Uh, What can't be ignored specifically in politics is the danger of pride in leadership. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is in opposition to pride. God is in opposition to the proud. And so as followers of Christ, we too should be in opposition to prideful leaders. Proverbs 8, 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way in the perverted mouth I hate. 1 Timothy 3.6 shows uh, shows us that pride can can lead someone into the condemnation of the devil. A prideful heart, specifically in a leader, is one of the best tools in the enemy's hands. We should despise prideful leaders. They're not to be admired. And so with that said, one of the greatest dangers in this political season, especially for the church, is is to outwardly and eagerly identify, excuse, and promote prideful leaders that are in blatant opposition to God because of their moral character. We cannot excuse nor ignore the character of any leader on any side. 
Uh, and so with that said, as we think about how to think about politics, we need to look at both the person and their policies. Both matter deeply. We can't ignore either one. To excuse or to ignore either one is a very poor testimony to a watching world. And so to finish out this idea of how we think about politics, we need to then ask ourselves, <laughs> well, then how do we vote? How do we decide? Uh, if these are our two healthy God rails, then who do we vote for? Well, as I said, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. Uh, I'm here to tell you how to think about it and to be aware of the dangers and pitfalls to fall in with who you vote for. Because what, we should, what should be very obvious to this point is that we do not have a perfect option. And one of the most humbling and sobering things as a Christian going into this election is that no matter who you vote for, you're going to have to compromise on biblical values. You're going to have to excuse sin and evil that God hates in the policies and or the person. And so how do we decide? Well, Again, we search out God's word, uh, wrestle with what God has said in his word based on policies and the person, and we pray for God's wisdom to be made clear by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And you cast your vote, and as, one of, as my old pastor used to say often, uh, then you go take a nap, trusting that God is sovereign uh, and not your vote, nor the candidate that you vote for, uh, and letting it be a humble reminder that our world is broken because no matter who we vote for, it will not be perfect. Why? Uh, because as we said last week, sin infiltrates all of life. Uh, does this mean that we should not vote? No, absolutely not. Because as we've said, voting is one of the many means to bring physical reconciliation to our world. Although uh, our world is broken, God can still bring redemption and reconciliation no matter the leader, no matter the president, and no matter the political party. We need to remember that voting can bring redemption and recon reconciliation and make a difference, but it is astoundingly incomplete, limited, and it is still broken, which should be very humbling for us as Christians. And so if this is the case, the next question we need to, th to look at is number three, how should we talk about politics? At this point, I hope it's clear that we need to be careful not to put too much weight in politics. I need to walk in great humility and gentleness because politics is limited, broken, and it is not our Savior. God's word is clear that we do not live for this kingdom. We live for another kingdom. We vote in this world, but we do not vote for this world. Our vote should always be geared towards God's kingdom. And what I would argue, uh, because government is limited and far from perfect and not, <laughs> and not to belittle our vote, uh, because, but we, we do only get one vote. Uh, but do you know what I would say is way more influential? How we speak biblical truth and grace and kindness as we discuss politics. What I would argue is more important than who we vote for uh, is the way we talk to people and each other about politics. Politics absolutely matters. We're to think well and deeply about politics, but we, only, we can only vote every few years. What a deep tragedy it would be if that one vote caused division and discord in a relationship with a brother and sister with whom Christ died for. If you disagree on an issue or a way of voting with your brother or sister in Christ, talk through it. Sharpen one another, but do it in gentleness and grace, knowing that you're speaking to someone that was purchased by the blood of Jesus, that Christ died for that person. If the per and if the person you're speaking with is not a Christian, we need to give them a little bit more grace because they're coming from a different worldview. They need Christ more than they need your politics. Listen, if God says far more about our tongue, our character, and how we act than he, does say, than he says anything about government. In fact, in most places, when the Bible speaks about government, it's far more about how we speak and act than it is about actual government. And so over the next two months, I would call us to dig into the policies, pay attention to the candidate's character, seek God's word, pray for, the spirits, pray for spirit's wisdom to help make the best decision you can make, and then vote. But what I want, us to, I want to call us to, uh, what, it, what I believe is a better testimony to the world than any vote we could ever make, is to watch what you say and watch how you say it. To be slow to pass judgment to be gentle in correction, understand the limits and the audience of social media. Be careful of only speaking praise of one candidate and only speaking negative of another. We need to evaluate our intentions in both our public speech and in our private speech. 
We need to be quick to listen, and we need to be slow to speak. I would encourage all of us to meditate and memorize on one or two verses, maybe one like Ephesians 4.29. It says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So we have to ask, are our words giving life or are they taking life? Are our words building up or are our words tearing down? And, and again, I'll be the first to admit, I have to keep close watch on this because uh, in my life, my natural bent is to tear down. And I know that when I do this, I need, to be, I need to swallow my pride. I need to be quick to repent. I need to be quick to seek forgiveness. Because brothers and sisters, Proverbs 18, 21, this is what it says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 16, 24 says, Gracious words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. What we say and how we say it matter. And so I want to call us to walk in humility, uh, remembering that God is sovereign over the government. That no matter who is elected, God still sits on his throne and remembering that politics is a terrible God. Leaving us to ask our last question. Number four, where is our hope in politics? <laughs> and let me be very blunt about this. Any form uh, of hope that is found in politics is faulty and limited at best. If a political candidate is our only hope, what a tragedy we live in a world where people are searching for hope and answers and change, and if the only thing we know to do is to vote, how sad is that? If our greatest hope for change is policy change, we have lost touch and faith in the power of God that is funneled through the people of God. May we not lose sight that God has empowered us with his spirit to bring about real and eternal change that is only found in Jesus Christ. May we not, we can't act, believe, and treat each other as if a president is the sovereign ruler of our life. God is the sovereign ruler and supreme ruler of our life that unites the people of God. There's not a political party or a politician that can do this. We live in a world that sees any sort of power or nationalism as the only source of stability or control. And may we remember that our stability is found in Jesus Christ alone, not in a liberal, conservative politician or a political party. Because as I've said and want to be very clear on, politics is a terrible God. And may we not act and speak like it is our God. May we not have more faith in politics than in the resurrected Christ. We don't need a political revolution. We need a spiritual revolution. We need a Christ-exalted and empowered revolution. More than any political leader or political party in office running for a term or another term, our country needs to come to the term that Jesus Christ is the living God, that God came down from heaven to take away the sins of the world by dying on the cross for our sins so that people like you and me can be changed by the gospel, uh, but, not to not, but not only be changed by the gospel, but to also influence change by the spirit of the living God that lives inside of us. We don't need political power to make a difference. We need the power of God to make a difference. We need the power of God to make an eternal difference. And as I've already said, we don't live for this world. We live for the city that is to come. If it's easier for us to defend our politics at the expense of being offensive than it is to offend someone with the gospel, we need to check our allegiance. And we need to check which kingdom we live for. The Spirit of God is living and active, moving and working. And what an incredible opportunity we have to be gracious with our politics so that we can be offensive with the gospel. May we not place our patriotism as more important than our evangelism. If your speech or social media post would push away someone from an opposing party and cause a barrier to hearing the gospel, then we need to rethink what we say and we need to rethink how we say it. This is not at all to say that we shy away from hard truths, but to be sure that we season truth with grace. The gospel is already offensive enough. It's already offensive. It's already hard enough to take in. Let's not offend someone with politics before we offend them with the gospel. Because brothers and sisters, New City Church, may we remember the only perfect ruler this world has is Jesus Christ, our perfect king. The plans and policies of Jesus Christ are perfect and eternal. The character and person of Jesus Christ is perfect and without error. God's government, God's kingdom is the only perfect and eternal kingdom. Jesus is always good. He is always just. He always protects. And Jesus is peace. The purpose of government is to bring peace, order, and stability to its people. 
And only in and through the gospel of the kingdom can we find perfect peace, perfect order, and perfect stability. There are people all around us that that see a broken world and are longing for peace and order. And as we know, they will not find it in this world because the world is broken and it is marred by sin. It can only be found in the city that is to come where God will make every wrong right, where there will be no more pain or crying or tears. And the only way a person can get there is not to vote for a political party or a political candidate, hoping uh, that maybe they could bring more good than bad through our government. No. The only way a person will ever get into God's perfect and eternal kingdom is to cast a vote in faith for Jesus Christ crucified, believing in faith that Jesus came to earth, lived a sinless life, and then died on the cross bearing our sins so that we can be united with him in his perfect kingdom that is to come. We have a hope today that is not based on an election. We have a hope that is not based on the government or any political party or candidate. We have a hope that provides peace in Christ, a hope that brings joy and hardship, and a hope that can bring reconciliation and discord and in disharmony. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not only for an eternal kingdom, but it empowers us to bring, bring light and reconciliation and future glimpses of God's kingdom down to earth in the here and now. And so when we think and talk about politics, it is vital and essential for it to be viewed through the lens of God and his word and held in perspective in light of the gospel, remembering that politics is not our hope, but rather remembering that Jesus Christ is our only hope. And so with that said, as we close out our time here today, I want to call us to think well, and I want to call us to vote. But not just that, I want to call us to reflect and consider not just who we vote for, but more important, importantly, call us to remember which kingdom we live for. May we be a people marked by gospel humility and not by our political bullets. May our, may our speech be seasoned with grace and humility, so much so that when people who are without Christ, that come from a different worldview, when they disagree with us, when they disagree with us, but yet they're still intrigued Because though they disagree with us, what is not in question is our love and care for them. We can speak and hold to incredible truths while walking in an astounding love, putting on display that we live and for a great hope. Living with the truth that the that kingdom and governments will rise and fall. Political leaders will come and go. Policies will continually change. But what does not change and will never change is that Jesus is the only perfect king. He is the only perfect leader. And Jesus is the only perfect ruler. No matter what happens in this election, no matter who you vote for, what we know from God's word is that God holds all of it in his hands. Brothers and sisters, There are people all around us searching for hope. They are searching for truth. They are searching for answers. May we be a people that show our world that it is not found in politics, but rather it's found in Jesus Christ, our only perfect king. Let's pray. God, you rule and reign. You are good. You provide peace. You provide stability. Father, may we believe that today. May we, when we lift you high, May we lift Jesus Christ high as our greatest hope. May we trust in Christ as king, as supreme. And Father, may we show a world uh, where is the greatest hope that is found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in politics. It's found in Christ alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys want to stand with us and sing? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King.
to reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb that conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame this gospel truth of all shall not kneel and shall not pray by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me praise his name praise the father Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King. take just a moment um, while we're all standing and just take a time to reflect on what God has done for us in the cross, that Jesus came down, uh, lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross for our sins, and that through that, through Christ alone, can we find unity. There's no doubt about it that we live in a, in a broken world that is divided, uh, but we can find unity under Christ, under God, and his word, and in the gospel, and so I want to take time to remember that uh, and reflect on that. And then Jordan will come back up and sing and close this out. Son of Man, stories of a Savior, holiness with human hand, treasure for the traitor, no ear had heard, no eye had seen. of the Father until heaven came to live with me a rescue like no other
did not speak, you made no sound. You died for your accusers. And as your blood fell to the ground, we redefined my future. Father, we are grateful that you are king, that you are sovereign. And God, in the midst of the world that we live in, in the midst of what's happening over the next few months, God, we know that you're sovereign and you're good. Uh, God, help us to walk in humility with one another. God, help us to be unified in Christ in the midst of our differences. Uh, God, would you help us to love one another as you have loved us in Christ's name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Before we finish out our service this morning, I just have a couple quick announcements for us. Uh, the first of which is our giving. Uh, and so if you're new with us here today, uh, we actually don't want you to feel obligated to give in any way. Uh, in fact, we actually have a gift for you. So if you did not stop in on the way into the service today, we'd love for you to stop by after the service uh, there in the back. Uh, we actually have a gift for you there, and we'd love to meet you and connect with you. Uh, so please stop by after the service and do that. Uh, so with our giving, one thing that we say every single week is that your generosity fuels the mission of our church. Uh, and one way we're able to see that kind of go forth into to really all the, all the world is through supporting missionaries overseas. Uh, and so this week, I actually had the opportunity to connect to one of our missionaries that's in India right now uh, and talk about how over the past couple of weeks, they've been able to start training uh, some, some national believers that they've seen come to faith. They've started training them uh, on, on sharing their faith and discipleship and raising up new uh, people. And so and we praise God for that, and we're, we're, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to partner with them, again, through your generosity and being able to, to fuel and seeing that happen. Uh, so if you'd like to give here to New City, you can do that by going online uh, to newcitytpa.com forward slash give, and you can sign up to give there. 
Uh, the second thing I have for us today is our next steps table. Uh, so if you've been coming around New City for a little bit uh, and you would like to get a little bit more deeply connected to the life of our church, uh, the next steps table is where you can go to, to get all of your questions answered. Uh, maybe if you've been coming around and you are not involved in one of our city groups, uh, maybe you have recently come to faith and you want to take the, the first step of obedience in baptism, uh, or Maybe you just have questions about New City. The next steps table also in the back uh, is where you can go and get some of those questions answered and you can sign up for those things. And then lastly, the last thing I have for us today is serving, specifically serving here on Sundays. Uh, and so, you know, here at New City, we have three core values. We talk about them all the time. AIM, authentic relationships, intentional discipleship, and missional urgency. Uh, and specifically, we know that we can see intentional discipleship happen uh, through serving here on Sundays. Uh, we have the opportunity to invite those that we're discipling into serving alongside of us. And we also have the ability through serving uh, to empower people to take steps uh, of discipleship that maybe they would not do else, uh, elsewhere. And so, again, through serving on Sundays, we have the ability to see those things happen. Uh, and so if you would like to serve here on Sundays, uh, you can also stop by uh, the Next Steps table after the service and sign up there. Uh, that's all I have for us. Thank you so much for being here. New City Church, you are sent out.